Now that we've learned about the kinematic equations, we will apply them to a very important example, free fall. Free fall is simply when we drop an object and assume that there is no air resistance. If there is no air resistance, then objects near the surface of the Earth fall at a constant acceleration. This acceleration is given by 9.8 meters per second squared, and the direction of that acceleration is always downwards. Because there is very little air resistance acting on objects at low speeds, we can safely ignore air resistance in these situations. If that bothers you, one of the crowning achievements of this course is that we will actually be able to drop an object and consider its motion including air resistance. This will require some differential equations, so it's best postponed to the very end of the course. Let's go ahead and look at our first example. In this example, we're simply dropping an object from a height of 7 meters and ignoring air resistance. We're asking simple questions like how long does it take to hit the ground and what is its speed when it's halfway to the ground, 3.5 meters down. Solving this problem is going to present us with a chance to be systematic about our problem solving. One of the key takeaways from this course which will benefit you even if you're not going to be a physics major or even to study science, is that it is very important to approach these problems systematically. So what I want to do is give you a systematic approach to problems like these that you can apply throughout this course. Now, this systematic approach is not always necessary on every single problem, but practicing it is the key to developing your problem solving skills. So I encourage you to take the time to write down all these steps because it will benefit you in the long run, especially when you start getting to the harder problems like you would see on an AP exam. So let's get started. Now the first thing you should do in any problem is to draw a picture. The picture for this situation is quite simple. I just have a ball and it's moving downwards, as you can see here. The next step is to pick an origin in a positive direction. I said very early on in this chapter that these two choices are always necessary. And without being explicit about it, students can often make mistakes because they switch their origin halfway through a problem and they don't even realize it. So it's best to make sure to really write it down specifically. And that's what I do here in red. I chose the origin to be located at where it starts, and I chose the positive direction to be upwards. Now the choice of origin and positive direction is arbitrary, and it's a deep fact in physics that the outcome of our problem will not depend on our choice of origin and positive direction, which is to say when we answer our problem, we will get the same answer regardless. So for instance, if you wanted to make your origin at the ground, that would have been fine. If you wanted to make your positive direction point down, that would have been fine too. But I always make my positive direction point upwards, and in this problem, I'm going to start with my origin where it starts. Now steps three and four of our, my problem solving system are not relevant yet. We'll learn more about those in chapter five. Step five is simply to write down the kinematic variables. In this case, we're gonna use the variable y for our position because the object is moving up and down. Now, I need to know the acceleration, the initial velocity, and the initial position. The acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. We know the magnitude of the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. In this case, it's negative because I chose my positive direction to be upwards, and the object is accelerating downwards, as all objects do. My initial velocity is zero. While that's not explicitly stated in the problem, we can read it from the context of the object being dropped, and what we can infer is that the object was dropped from rest. And finally, my initial position is zero. It's zero because I chose my origin to be where it was originally located. If I had chosen my origin as a different location, say at the ground, this value would be different. But my value agrees with the origin that I chose. In step six, and this is often the most complicated part of the problem, is to state your problem in mathematical terms. In this case, I'm trying to answer the question, how long does it take to hit the ground? And to phrase that in mathematical terms, I write that out as what is t when y equals negative 7? Again, that's the appropriate question because I chose my origin to be where the object starts, and I know that the ground is located 7 meters below my object, in this case at a position of negative 7. So this is the correct question to ask. 
Now that the question has been asked correctly, step seven is simply to use my mathematical skills to solve the problem. I start by writing out the equation, y equals 1 half at squared plus v naught t plus y naught. I substitute in my values. I simplify that, and then I take the final steps to solve for t. In this case, t is 1.2 seconds. I include a final step here, step eight, which is to answer the question. As we'll see in a problem later in this section, it's important to make sure you are answering the question and not just writing down what you solved. This will often help you avoid mistakes where you need to use the calculation to finally answer the question. But in our case, it's just simply the same value. So I write down it in a sentence, it takes 1.2 seconds to hit the ground. In part B, I'm asking what is its speed when it's halfway to the ground. And the good news is, is I've already done all my setup in steps one through five, so I need to just start by asking the correct question. In this case, the question is what is V when Y equals negative 3.5 meters? Again, negative 3.5 because it's below the origin, halfway to the ground. The most appropriate equation to use here is v squared equals v naught squared plus 2a delta y. That's because there is no explicit dependence on time, and so I don't need to worry about time when I'm solving. I simply plug in the values of my kinematic variables, simplify, and solve. In this case, the value I get is 8.3, but I need to recognize that there are actually two roots of this quadratic, Really what I should have is the negative root because the object is going downwards in the negative direction. This is where I need to change this value to answer the question and to answer it knowing that its speed is the absolute value, 8.3 meters per second. Let's look at another example. This time the ball is thrown upwards and rises and then falls. We start with the same problem solving system as before. And the first step is to draw a picture. Here I draw a person throwing this ball up, it rises and then it comes back down. The next step is to draw an origin in positive direction. My origin is located at where the ball was initially located when it was, before it was thrown, and my positive direction is upwards. As I said before, three and, steps three and four we won't get to till chapter five. It's now time to write down my kinematic variables. Again, I'm going to use the variable y for position because it's going up and down. The acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Again, that's because the magnitude is always 9.8 meters per second squared, but the acceleration is downwards, which in this case is in the negative direction. The initial velocity is 3 meters per second, and note that it's positive here because it was being thrown upwards, so the positive 3 meters per second is important. The initial position is zero because again, I chose my origin so that it's zero. In part A, I'm being asked the question, how high is the ball after 0.2 seconds? So to translate that into math terms, that's the question, what is y when t equals 0.2 seconds? Now I can start to solve that. The most appropriate equation is y equals 1 half at squared plus v naught t plus y naught. I substitute in the values I was given and I solve, and that gives me 0.4 meters. And again, it's best to answer this question, and we can answer it unambiguously as it's 0.4 meters above where it was thrown. In part B, I'm asking for the velocity at the same time. The math question is what is V when T equals 0.2 seconds? I use the appropriate kinematic equation, V equals AT plus V naught. I plug in my values and simply solve 1.04 meters per second. So I can now answer the question. Its velocity is 1.04 meters per second upwards. And again, I know the velocity is upwards because the answer I got was positive. In part C, I'm asked a more complicated question. When does the ball reach its maximum height? And as I said, step six, translating this word problem into a math problem can be often the trickiest part. In this case, the appropriate question is what is t when v equals zero? 
How do I know that? Well, maximum height corresponds to when the velocity is zero. How long is it stopped? Well, just for an instant. A split second later, it's gonna have a negative velocity, it's gonna be going downwards. In a split second earlier, it was going upwards with a positive velocity. So there is one point in time where it's zero, and that's when it was at its highest point. Now that I have the appropriate question, I can write down my equation, v equals at plus v naught. I can plug in my values, take the steps to solve the problem, and end up with my time, 0.31 seconds. And now I make sure to answer the question, it reaches max height, 0.31 seconds after being thrown. Part D is asking what the ball's maximum height is, and now that I know the time, the question is straightforward. What is y when t equals 0.31 seconds? I can now solve using my kinematic equation. I plug in the values. And I arrive at a value for y, 0.46 meters. Now I should write down my answer in a sentence. Its max height is 0.46 meters above where it was thrown. This elevator problem is a bit more complicated. In this problem, a screw falls as an elevator starts to rise through the air. So we have two objects moving, the screw dropping downwards and the elevator moving upwards. This is an example of a situation where drawing our picture and specifying our origin in positive direction is very important. So let's go ahead and draw a picture here. I have the elevator with the screw falling downwards, and then I also have the elevator rising, which I draw by this dash, dashed box going upwards. I should go ahead and draw the ground level, and so I draw the ground level assuming the elevator was at the floor to begin with. This allows me to draw an origin in positive direction, and in this case, I'm gonna fix my origin to the ground, not to the elevator. It's gonna be fixed to the ground, and my positive direction is gonna be upwards. Now you may ask yourself, could we have fixed the origin to the elevator, and the answer is yes. It is possible to do problems like this, but we'll talk about the complications more in chapter four under relative velocities. So you need to be careful, and I'll tell you, it's best to always attach your origin to the earth because as far as we're concerned, it is effectively not moving. Now let's go ahead and write down the kinematic variables. In this case, there's two objects, so I wanna write down the kinematic variables for the screw first. Again, I use the variable y because it's moving up and down. Its acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared because the acceleration is always 9.8 meters per second squared and it's going and the acceleration is downwards and I chose my positive direction to be upwards. The screw dropped from rest so its initial velocity is zero meters per second and it was located initially three meters above the origin so its initial position is positive three. I also need to keep track of the elevator floor and so I'll write down kinematic variables for it as well. For its acceleration, that's given to me. It's positive four meters per second squared because it's accelerating upwards. Its initial velocity is zero because it was at rest to begin with. And then the initial position of the floor was at ground level, zero meters. In part A, we're asking how long does it take for the screw to hit the floor? And if you remember the speeding car problem that we saw in the previous section, this question will be similar. We're asking for what is t when y of the screw equals y of the elevator floor. If you had a hard time coming up with that, just know this is where practice can be your friend. Practicing coming up with these questions is often the most important part of solving these problems. Now that we have our appropriate math question, we simply write down our equations, substitute in our kinematic equation, Substitute in our variables. And solve. What we finally get is t is equal to 0 0.66 seconds. And so we know it takes 0 0.66 seconds to hit the floor. 
In part B, how much longer would it have taken if the elevator was at rest? Well, in this case, we're not going to be able to solve for it directly. This is a good example of solving for something and then using that something to get the final answer. In this case, what I want to figure out is how long would it have taken to fall if the elevator wasn't moving? In this case, that question is, what is t when y sub s is equal to zero, when the screw goes all the way back to the elevator's original level? I write in my kinematic equations, and in this case, I can use the work I did before to write down the position of the screw. I now solve for time, and I end up with 0.78 seconds. Now this is why it's important to always make sure you answer the question, because this is not what the question was asking for. What we're asked for is how much longer did it take. So we take our answer that we just got, subtract it from the answer to part A to get 0.12 seconds, and that is the final answer. It would have taken 0.12 seconds longer.